Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to data security strategies in Domain 2 to show you how they interrelate to one another, which should be a big help in your studies. This is the third of five videos for Domain 2. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a small part of our complete CCSB masterclass. In this mind map, we're going to discuss all sorts of different ways that we can protect data in the cloud. The major way that we protect data in the cloud is through all sorts of encryption. We can encrypt data at rest, in motion, and in use. We can use encryption and more broadly, various cryptographic methods to protect the confidentiality of data, ensure integrity, and even achieve super helpful things like authenticity, which lets us know who sent some data, proof of origin. Cryptography in the cloud is a huge topic, so we'll devote two mind maps to the subject in domain four, links in the description below. DRM, Digital Rights Management, are the systems that protect digital content from unauthorized access and distribution by enforcing usage policies and access controls. DRM is another important topic that we'll discuss in more detail in the last fifth mind map of domain two. Now, so let's get into the first topic that we are going to discuss in detail, DLP, data loss prevention. DLP is a suite of technologies designed to prevent sensitive data such as personal data, financial data, or intellectual property from being accidentally or maliciously exposed, leaked, or lost. DLP ensures that sensitive information is securely stored and transmitted in compliance with policies and regulations. The important here word here is sensitive, sensitive data. A DLP system can't and shouldn't prevent all data from being viewed, saved, sent, printed, etc. So a critical requirement of an effective DLP system is knowing what data is sensitive data. In other words, you need data classification. You need to know what is your sensitive data. Let's now go through the major functionality that DLP systems provide. Discovery and classification is a DLP system's ability to scan and identify sensitive data across an organization's cloud storage endpoints and networks. DLP systems can then categorize the data based on sensitivity and business relevance. In other words, discovery involves automating the process of finding and classifying sensitive data. This is super helpful because as I mentioned, it's critical that data be properly classified for a DLP system to be useful. Predefined templates, patterns, or even AI based algorithms can be used to identify sensitive data, such as personal data, financial data, and intellectual property, etc. Monitoring is the DLP system's ability to see how data is being used, what data is in motion across the network, and where data is being stored. Based on what the DLP system is seeing, it can then detect potential risks or policy violations in real time, and then send alerts. Enforcement refers to a DLP system's ability to go beyond just alerting and possibly blocking something. DLP systems can block some data from being copied to a USB drive or stop data from being emailed out of the organization or data being stored unencrypted on a file server. Enforcement goes way beyond simply blocking. Some DLP systems can take actions like encrypting files, redacting sensitive information, or notifying administrators when data use violations violates company policies. Enforcement can be tailored to business needs to allow for a legitimate business use of sensitive data, but restricting risky activities, unauthorized activities. Now, for a DLP system to be able to monitor and potentially perform enforcement actions across the organization, we need to talk about where we need to put DLP capabilities. We need to talk about the architecture of a DLP solution. Network DLP focuses on monitoring and controlling data as it moves across. The network preventing unauthorized transmission of sensitive data through various communication channels like email web file servers file transfers etc network dlp systems monitor traffic in real time to inspect data in motion this is typically done through deep packet inspection to analyze the contents of data flowing through network gateways or proxies if sensitive data is detected the system can block quarantine or alert administrators on predefined policies. 
you will typically need multiple network-based DLP sensors spread across your network in order to have visibility into various network segments, as well as ingress and egress points out of your network, into and out of your network. Storage DLP focuses on identifying and protecting sensitive data at rest, whether it's stored in databases, file systems, cloud storage, or shared network drives, wherever it's being stored. Storage DLP systems can scan storage locations for sensitive data and classify it based on predefined patterns, like we talked about before, like PII and credit card numbers. And these storage-based solutions will ensure that data is encrypted, stored securely, and compliant with regulations. Alerts can be triggered for non-compliant data storage practices and access controls can be enforced. Endpoint DLP focuses on monitoring and secure data on users' devices. For example, laptops, desktops, mobile devices. And the whole point is to prevent unauthorized copying, printing, or transferring of sensitive data from endpoints, making sure that users aren't using the data inappropriately. A DLP agent will be installed on endpoint devices, which provides monitoring activities such as copying data to USB drives, printing sensitive documents, or sending files to external cloud services. The DLP agent can enforce security policies by blocking certain actions or alerting in real time. To sum it up, network-based DLPs monitors data in motion. Storage-based DLP monitors data at rest and endpoint DLP monitors data in use. All right, onward. Let's now discuss the major DLP components. A DLP appliance is either a physical hardware device or a virtual machine that is deployed within a network to monitor manage and enforce data protection policies. These appliances handle the heavy lifting of monitoring network traffic, inspecting data, and applying security policies. An endpoint agent is software installed on users' devices, such as laptop, desktops, and mobile devices, like we just talked about. It monitors and controls sensitive data on endpoints. A hypervisor agent is a DLP component deployed at the hypervisor level in a virtualized environment. And the hypervisor DLP enables monitoring and enforcement of data protection policies across virtual machines running on a hypervisor without the need to install individual agents on each VM. A hypervisor-based DLP agent can also be very useful in eliminating blind spots from inter-VM communication. Let me explain that sentence. <laughs> if you have two VMs running on the same hypervisor and they're sending packets back and forth to each other, these packets likely aren't leaving the hypervisor and going across the network where a network-based DLP appliance would be able to inspect the traffic. Instead, the hypervisor will simply move the packets directly between the two VMs. This creates a blind spot. If you want to monitor for data in motion between the VMs, you can do so by installing a DLP capability on the hypervisor. And this can help to eliminate inter-VM communication blind spots. DLP SaaS could be where a SaaS application will have some DLP functionality built into it that a customer can tap into. DLP SaaS can also refer to cloud-based DLP solutions delivered as a service. For example, a DLP capability that monitors data flows between cloud applications like in Google Workspace. All right, and that concludes our discussion of DLP. Let's now move on to other techniques that can be used to protect the data in the cloud. Masking is a data obfuscation technique where characters like an X or a star are used to hide all or part of the sensitive data. For example, receipts will mask your credit card number used for payment. So it won't list out your full credit card number. Usually your credit card number will be 12 stars and then the last four digits. That's masking. And here's what masking looks like. By the way, this is my business partner, John's credit card number. So in case you wanna go on a shopping spree, use that number. All right, random substitution is another data obfuscation technique where sensitive data is replaced with randomly generated characters or values that do not follow any specific pattern. Algorithmic substitution is a data obfuscation technique where sensitive data is replaced by a value generated through an algorithm, ensuring that the resulting data has some of the same properties as the original data, but without revealing sensitive information. Shuffling is another data obfuscation technique where sensitive data is shuffled around within a data set. For example, one column of data is shifted up a few rows and another column data is shifted down a few rows and so forth. This ensures that the data set retains the same data points, but disassociates them from their original entities. 
Now, there are two ways these data obfuscation methods can be performed, statically or dynamically. Static obfuscation means creating a separate and distinct copy of the data where this data is obfuscated even in storage. This is often done to create a copy of production data <laughs> to be used in a test environment. But you're obfuscating the copied data to ensure sensitive data is protected when you move that data from production into your test environment. Dynamic obfuscation means that sensitive data is protected by obfuscating it on the fly, in real time, ensuring that unauthorized users see only obfuscated data without altering the actual data that's stored. An example would be masking a customer's credit card number on a call center agent screen. Tokenization replaces sensitive data with a unique token, which are random values that reference the original data stored in a separate secure database, the token vault. The actual data is kept secure and the tokens are used for processing. Deletion, of course, is the complete removal of data from a system or database, often done to meet privacy or compliance requirements such as GDPR or HIPAA. Once deleted, the data is no longer accessible or recoverable and therefore pretty secure, I guess. Data de-identification or anonymization refers to the process of removing or obscuring personal identifiers from a data set to prevent the identification of individuals. The goal is to transform or remove personal data so that it can no longer be linked back to specific individuals. Direct identifiers are pieces of information that can be immediately and uniquely used to identify individuals without needing additional information. Perfect examples of direct identifiers are social security numbers, passport numbers, driver's license numbers, etc. Indirect identifiers are information that on their own may not directly identify a person, but when combined with other data, they can reveal an individual's identity. Examples include gender, birth, geographic indicator, like a zip code or postal code, hair color, eye color, blood type. These are all of examples of indirect identifiers. And if you put enough of these indirect identifiers together, you can potentially uniquely identify someone. And by the way, the, the reason that I just mentioned direct and indirect identifiers there is those are two things that you, that's what you want to look for when you're de-identifying or anonymizing data. You want to look for and remove any direct identifiers and also look for and potentially even remove indirect identifiers. All right, now let's talk about an emerging technology that is a brilliant idea. Homomorphic encryption is a form of encryption that allows computation to be performed directly on encrypted data without needing to decrypt it first. The result of the computation remains encrypted and can be decrypted later to reveal the results as the operations were performed on the original unencrypted data. It's a very cool idea. It, just to sum it up here, right? The whole idea of homomorphic encryption is that you can actually perform calculations on data while the data remains encrypted. Brilliant idea. Unfortunately, homomorphic encryption is not very practical yet for most mainstream use cases due to its high computational overhead. It's basically super slow, so you can't use it in a lot of situations that you might want to. All right, that's an overview of data security strategies in Domain 2, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam.